And if you have, you know, folks, or whether they're travelers or importers or, or transshippers, and if they're doing their part to basically open up their books, so that way you can pre-screen them, then yeah, obviously you want to focus on the ones that don't want you to pre-screen them. Before we get started with the show, here's a quick word from our sponsor, Global Training Center. As trade compliance professionals, you want to make sure that your procedures and documentation are completed as correctly as possible to avoid any delays and possible fines. We provide a range of trade compliance courses that will fit your needs. From in-person or web training to recorded on-demand courses, we can train one or even thousands on your team through your learning platform or on our portal. We can even customize a private session for your team. Go to globaltrainingcenter.com to find out more. We've got a good show coming up. Why don't you introduce our our guests and we're going to get into a great discussion, folks. Sure. Um, So a few weeks ago here in El Paso, um, as part of the uh, NCBFAA, uh, they brought an event to El Paso. Um, It was called the Southern Border uh, Trade Conference or something like that. But uh, we attended um, Global Training Center and myself, um, uh, kind of sort of part of the podcast. uh, I was there. It was a, a one day event and uh, it was really interesting. It was really good because um, it focused a lot around uh, security, uh, a lot of uh, a lot of um, information on data and cyber and and just physical security. Um, there was a second part to that conference that was actually like really intense security stuff. I mean, like they had some really like hardcore uh, security stuff. But anyway, um as part of that, I met uh, I met the president of an organization called the uh, Business Alliance for Secure Commerce, uh, otherwise known as BASC. Um, some of you may or may not know about it, but uh, I met him. He's a president. He's the international president for BASC. His name is Eric Moncayo. Um, he is based out of, um, well, he's physically in San Antonio, Texas, but uh, the organization, I believe, is based out of Miami. Um, I may be wrong or not, but the reason I'm, we have him on is because we are trying to help them and uh, talk a little bit about both the organization, but also uh, the fact that they have a annual conference coming up here in September. So we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, it will be in Miami, September 25 and 26. But uh, let's bring them in. Hey, uh, Eric, how are you doing? Lalo, Andy, thanks for having me. Uh, good to see you guys again. Uh, I feel like I run into you guys at every trade show that I go to, at least the last couple of years now. <laughs> so I'll be a part of it. Oh, it's great. Well, welcome to our show. This is going to be, I think, a really good discussion because folks talk about, you know, supply chain security and security of cargo and security of ports and security of this and that and whatever else. So it's like uh, this, I'm, I'm going to be very interested in uh, uh, learning more about BASC because I got to say, personally, I'm actually not as familiar with it. Uh, Lala was talking about it, was uh, talking uh, very uh, positively about what you guys have uh, got. So once you talk a little bit, a little bit of that, why don't you mention a little bit about what is BASC and uh, and what's its focus as far as the association? Sure. So let me tell you a little bit about myself. So one thing I don't know that I, if I mentioned it to Lalo the last time we spoke, but I'm actually born and raised in El Paso, Texas. Um, and then I, I joined Customs and Border Protection probably about 27, 8, 28 years ago now. Uh, and I left El Paso and, and never went back. Uh, and so I've uh, been traveling all over the world. I've, I've lived in several different countries and had several different assignments with U.S. Customs. And then I retired with U.S. Customs in 2021. Uh, and so I was in Washington, D.C. I was uh, the head of international affairs for, for customs when I retired. And then um, my second to last duty station was San Antonio, Texas. And my family wanted to come back to San Antonio, Texas. So we moved back to San Antonio. And then after I'd been out of the federal government for a couple of years, uh, I was contacted by the World Basque Organization and they inquired if I'd be interested in joining them as a, as a member of their team. And, and for background, uh, I, I didn't really get to know Basque until I was living in the country of Panama. And so when I was working with U.S. Customs, I was a, a diplomatic representative to the country of Panama. And uh, one of the first meetings that I took when I was down there was with the local Basque chapter. And so I didn't know much about the organization until I, until I met them there. And so the lady that was the director of that office, uh, we sat down and we had a long conversation and I learned really quickly that she was essentially advocating, um, on behalf of the private sector to 
the host nation government, the government of Panama on all things, trade facilitation, all things, cargo security, all things, uh, uh, security of importations, exportations, and transshipments. As, as you can imagine, Panama is a very critical, very strategic uh, transshipment point for the entire Western Hemisphere. And, and so they're very concerned about trying to keep, make sure that, that the trains, uh, the trucks, and the boats are moving through Panama as quickly as possible. So anything they can do to facilitate and expedite the trade is of critical importance to them. And so she represented uh, a couple of hundred different companies uh, as, a, as a Bass chapter president. And so in speaking to her, I realized really quick as a customs rep that she was going to be one of my best friends in the country because she was able to bring in the trade community. So that way I could have a conversation with them on behalf of the U.S. government. And then together we could go and we could have a conversation on uh, speaking in one voice to the government of Panama talking about uh, back then they didn't have an EO program. And back then they didn't have a lot of these things that, that are, are commonplace nowadays in many countries. And so we were basically kind of initiating that conversation representing the U.S. government and the private sector in the, the country of Panama. And so when they called me several years later and asked me if I'd be interested in joining the team, for me, it was just an extension of what I'd been doing for the past 25 years. Uh, as, as a customs representative, I'd been speaking as a to, to the trade community, to foreign governments about the importance of trade security, cargo security. And so it simply, I was just moving to the other end of the table now. Uh, and now I'm a representative of the trade community speaking to governments in general about the importance of cargo security and, and, and collaboration and information sharing and all those types of things. So it was a very smooth transition for me uh, to slide over to Basque. And so when they brought me on, they brought me on as the executive director. And then after I'd been on for a few months, uh, the president at the time, his name was uh, Fermin Cusa, he retired from, from the World Basque Organization and then they uh, offered me the uh, international president job, which is where I'm, what I'm doing now is I'm the international president of the World Basque Organization. And, and so just to give your, your audience a little bit of background. So in the mid nineties, um, there was conversations that were taking place with the U.S. Customs Service and the maquiladoras in Southern California, the, the companies that had bases and operations in Southern California, the San Diego area and the Tijuana area. And so they were trying to figure out a way to keep the cargo moving along the, the San Diego Tijuana border. And one of the things that they were very concerned about, because back then Mattel uh, had their maquiladora in Tijuana. And so they were very concerned about, you know, these shipments of trucks and Barbies being contaminated with uh, marijuana or other types of drugs. And so they, they were very concerned about, you know, their, their brand being impacted negatively by the cartels uh, operating in the area. So they're very interested in working with customs to not only expedite their importations into the U.S., but they're also very interested in securing their operation. And so that led to a pilot program. Again, this is 1996. That led to a pilot program where Mattel and several other, several other companies started working with customs to basically open up their doors so that way customs could come and inspect their operation and, and make sure that they, that they were doing everything in their, in their capability to secure their operation to minimize the risk. You know, obviously you can't eliminate risk, but you can do, you, you can do your best to minimize it. And so that pilot program, uh, was started in the mid nineties in, in, uh, in San Diego and Tijuana of this collaboration between customs and the private sector where the onus is on the private sector to secure the, the, the supply chain, or at least do their part to secure the supply chain. All right. And Eric, let me jump in here on this is that I love this approach because in this collaboration, this is one of those where if you're a good corporate citizen is coming and collaborating with, you know, customs and, and the other agencies, if you will, as appropriate to say, this is what we're doing. We're crossing the T's, dotting the I's. Is there anything else that you think that we need to do? But it, what it does is you take this big bucket of cargo that's moving. And at least now it's it's compartmentalizing or or segregating out that stuff that has already been looked at. It's like, you know what? These guys have a good handle on it. Let's take that out. And so it, it enables you to, which is probably the majority of the cargo anyway, that people are good corporate citizens. They're doing what their thing. But as customs, it allows them to be able to focus on the items that they need to be focused on. So in other words, the good stuff is processed. It's good. It gets uh, uh, processed quickly. 
And then, uh, you know, again, it's focusing on that, that smaller percentage, uh, which I love is, is so to that effect is that I, I think that's one of those that also helps in the morale of, uh, of, uh, customs as well as the, the agencies and all that. Would that, that be a pretty fair statement and a good way to work it? Absolutely. Absolutely. So, so what, what you're talking about, Andy, is something that, that's become kind of the common, like a common playbook now in, in the 20th century. And this is or the 21st century because this was a conversation that was initiated in the mid nineties before any of these programs existed. There was no CT path back then. There was no AEO program back then. Uh, a lot of things have changed since then. And so back then, this was the, the initial stages of these types of conversations, which now we see them very clearly. It's like, oh, yeah, that sounds just like what CPAT, CTPAT is trying to do. Or that sounds exactly what uh, like the AO programs that, that, that we're trying to get off the ground in all these different countries. But back then, 30 years ago, I mean, this was the first attempt to try to make something like this work where it wasn't customs versus the private sector. It was customs and the private sector trying to filter out all those bad actors. Well, and I was going to say, you were right in the midst of a uh, a change in the approach that Customs was taking, because uh, up to that point, and I remember that era, I re- up to that point, it was a case where Customs looked at everybody as you're just, you know, everybody was trying to smuggle something or everybody was, you know, we got to, we got to prove you that you're a good one. Not, and, and so, as you said, it was that, that conflict type right off the bat and puts the private sector at the defense uh, or in a defensive posture. Now it's a collaboration and it's like, Hey, we're pulling together. We want the same thing you do. We don't want the bad guys in. We don't want the bad stuff in. We want to, you know, deal with this. And I think to your credit, that was, uh, I bet that was, it was probably very, uh, you were somewhat, uh, in, in the agencies and the personnel were a little bit, uh, nervous about things, but on the same token, I bet it was exciting to see the change. Well, I'll be honest with you. I'll be honest with you, Andy. So I was living in Mexico, um, mm-hmm. in the mid two thousands when, uh, we were starting off the, the fast program, uh, oh, yes. for, the secure, yeah. the, for the trucks. Yes. Right. And, 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 and I'm not going to lie to you that there was a lot of hesitation by all parties. <laughs> oh, yeah. Nobody trusted any. Nobody trusted anybody. <laughs> nobody nobody and, trusted and, anybody. You're right. It looked like a, what do they so call it? A, me, they call it a Mexican standoff where everybody's just like, <laughs> what do they call it? A very diplomatic like one. A very yeah. diplomatic <laughs> one. Because <laughs> I, would, I would sit there and I would have these conversations with my colleagues, you know, as a customs representative. And I'd be talking to folks in Laredo. Or I'd be talking to folks in El Paso or what, what have you. And they're saying, why would we ever trust and fill in the blank? They didn't trust anybody. <laughs> so, so, so talking to the guy at the port that's working the cargo lane, you know, and, and explain to him, okay, well, you don't need to check this, this truck. Just like Andy said, the idea is that truck's already been screened. So you don't need to check. And he's like, I would never trust you to tell me which ones I should and shouldn't screen. As a matter of fact, the one, the one I'm, I'm going to screen is the one you told me not to look at. <laughs> and so it had this reversed effect for many years. It took a long time for, for everybody just to kind of understand the concept and embrace the concept. But it was, it was, uh, you know, pulling that sled uphill for a long time. And, and like I said, I'll, I'll be the first one to admit that, that, that I was very hesitant in the beginning. And so it took me a while to, to become a believer in it. Uh, and then once I became a believer, I became an advocate for it. And so that's something that, that, you know, that was kind of my job in many of the, in, in many places that I worked the last, the latter half of my career was trying to promote all these different trust programs, you know, not just the traveler and the trader programs, but the ones for, for folks that are flying into the country, which is now global entry, pre-check, all these different things that we've now gone so accustomed to, you know, back in, back in, uh, you know, in the nineties. Post 9-11, you know, speeding Everyone things up yes. and, oh, and less man. screening were the exact opposite of where everybody was rowing. And so it took us a while just to kind of basically kind of start moving that battleship and start pivoting back to, OK, so like you said at the beginning, let's focus our attention where we have to. And if you have, you know, folks, or whether they're travelers or importers or, or transshippers, and if they're doing their part to basically open up their books so that way you can pre-screen them, then yeah, obviously you want to focus on the ones that don't want you to pre-screen them because the ones that don't want you to pre-screen them, they're the ones that you should be, you know, focusing all your attention on. Because one of the things that I'd like to talk about is nobody has the resources. Nobody has the resources to do it all. 
to do it all. You know, the, the thought of we need to examine a hundred percent of the cargo. You know, I know that even Congress was talking about it and it was, it was beating up customs at the time. It was like, okay, you really want us to do that? All right, let's start with in some of, <laughs> so let's start looking at, and I think California was a, one of fine, uh, uh, Senator Feinstein was one. It's like, okay, we can start that. It would back up the port and all that. So realistically, you can't do a hundred percent. And it, in the pendulum, you know, was emotional and all that and then came back around. So to your point, I guess, is that that was groundbreaking times and it took a while, like you said, it, to build up the trust. And as things have gone on now, look at where we're at is that there is strong collaboration on so many fronts. But the, I guess let me ask this question is that with the Basque initiatives in that association, is that something where Basque has been coming in, helping to, I guess, establish some parameters and standards as far as what people should be doing in their in their supply chain? Absolutely. So, so I don't want to I don't want to bore you with, with with the history too much. But what's fascinating is that so when customs basically compelled the private sector to take some ownership of this, um, that led to this you know coalition where where okay, so what can we do? And, and they started basically kind of bringing in a bunch of experts to try to figure this out with under the tutelage of, of the U.S. Customs Service. And so where, where, the, where the initiative actually took off was in Colombia because they were reeling and recovering from their narco wars of the 80s. And so they were trying to get their, their business and their, their, their commerce with the U.S. jump started. And so they were looking for anything they could do to basically build up that trust with the U.S. government to allow more shipments uh, at, a, at a more expedited rate coming out of Colombia. And so they, they approached the U.S. Customs and they said, hey, we would love to, you, to do this pilot in Colombia if you would be willing to entertain having the pilot in Colombia. So in a couple of the ports in uh, Barranquilla and Cartagena, that's where the pilot was expanded to. So it went from Tijuana, uh, Baja California, all the way down to Colombia. And then in Colombia, it just spread like wildfire. And so nowadays we have over 4,000 companies all through Latin America. And most of those are in Colombia, in Peru and in Ecuador. And so if you look at like, you know, the Andes and, and, and the cocaine flow from the, from the Western hemisphere, you can see where it basically starts there and it goes out in, in four or five different directions, but mostly through those, through those three countries. And so all the, all the exporters in that region were trying to find ways to screen their cargo and screen their operations. That way they could minimize the risk because they're trying to get as much out as possible. And they don't just in, in down there in Ecuador, they don't want, you know, the narcotics police and the customs police ripping open every single container as soon as they seal it. And, and so what they're trying to do is, is try to adopt as many best practices as they can to secure their cargo. And so that turned into, uh, the, 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 the management system that Basque they, uh, built in the late nineties at this point. And that has evolved over the years. And because we were started with customs, we've always been very attuned to input from customs to include different facets of the evaluation process to make sure that we're, that the, that the, that the business, the, the trades community is doing their, their part to screen as much as, uh, of their operation as possible. And so after 9-11, Commissioner Robert Bonner, he wanted something like that in-house. He wanted an internal program to do something like that. And there was where CTPAT was born. And so CTPAT was born, but it was the same group of people that had helped start Basque using the same, you know, uh, uh, table of contents, per se, of how Basque was built to start the CTPAT program. And the two programs have grown side by side ever since. And so now CTPAT's up to 11,000 members. BASC is up to 4,000 members. But the but we have maintained alignment with the CTPAT standard ever since. And so to this day, when CTPAT rolled out the forced labor requirements, BASC adjusted their standards to make sure that they were still harmonized, still aligned with the CTPAT standard. So if you get a BASC certification anywhere uh, where BASC operates and we're, we're in Latin America, that city, that, that standard, that a certification from BASC is going to be consistent with any CTPAT certification that, that anything CTPAT is going to ask of you. And now that that evolved into being pushed out as a priority by the World Customs Organization, but they call it the AEO program. 
U.S. calls it CTPAT, everyone else calls it the AO. So what BASC has tried to do, and we've tried to spend the last uh, 10 years now helping all these different customs agencies throughout Latin America build their AO programs. And so what we do is not only we bring in our, our experts to explain to customs, this is all the different facets of the, of the, of the risk analysis cycle that you want to be looking at, but you also want to be training your people and then training the trade community. And so there's a lot of training that we offer to U.S. Cu- to, to different customs agencies throughout Latin America. And then we help them build up their programs because what we want to do is we always want to be that advocate and that ally. Uh, to the trade community and to the public sector. You know, we see ourselves in Basque as basically that, that, that middle point, that, that liaison between the two, the two entities. Basque is a non-for-profit agency. And so what we try to do is basically help both, uh, achieve those common objectives. And, and so, like you said, this is something that, that where we're at today, it's amazing we're, we're, that, that we've come this far. There's still a long way to go. Uh, but nonetheless, now you see that commitment across the board from every government you know, that we deal with throughout Latin America is committed to, 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 to building their AO program. They're committed to, to selling it to the trade community in their countries. And we in back are committed to helping them any way that we can. And so we've been able to grow as a good partner, not only to the U.S. customs, but to basically every customs in Latin America over the last 25, now 30 years. Well, and here's the thing is that what I'm seeing and what you're doing with your organization <clears throat> excuse me, is coming alongside both the custom side and the, and the private sector side to, you know, I guess, standardize the, the approach in these different countries, uh, on what to, to look for, or what to expect, uh, stringent, uh, you know, uh, requirements to get that certification. But at the same time, by doing that, and building up the trust, if you will, there of the local officials and, and, and the, uh, reciprocal, I guess, recognition of some of this from other countries. It's the facilitation of trade. And let's just face it with a strong facilitation of trade uh, is then you're stimulating more and more trade. It's, it's generating jobs. It's stim- it, it is, uh, contributing to the GDP or the, the economies, if you will, of both countries, you know, the exporting country, the importing country and all that. So that sounds absolutely fantastic, especially if you're uh, involved with the WCO and and uh, as this is uh, being rolled out, that is fantastic. By the way, folks, if uh, you've heard the term WCO, that's the World Customs Organization. So that's kind of like a, a, you know, it's it, the best way I describe it is it's kind of like a trade association for customs in, uh, of, uh, officials in different countries all, you know, working together, I guess, right? It's like the UN of customs. There, there you go. There you go. Yeah. That's true. <laughs> so I've had the privilege of, uh, you know, working with and, in, and sitting in meetings from a private sector, uh, in WCO. And I saw some of the integral, uh, that's probably a better way of it, the UN and, uh, of customs. It's, uh, you know, some of the positioning on different issues that go on from different countries is like, uh, but it's, it's still, fascinating. it's good. It's fascinating. So. So where do we go next? It's like, uh, so getting this certification is the certification then for a company or for individuals or what do we do here or for facilities? What? It's for a facility. And so what we do is we certify facilities and, and because we're looking at physical security, we're looking at employee screening, we're looking at, 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 you know, monitors, uh, surveillance, uh, we're looking at, at, you know, uh, compartmentalization of the processes. You said something earlier, Andy, that, 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 re, that reminded me of a, of a story that I once heard. I had a boss that, that he gave me a compliment one day and he's like, you know what, Eric, you run a tight ship and tight ships don't sink. And so that's kind of what I like to see is that's what we like to kind of share with our, with our companies is that if you run a tight ship, I'm not going to say that you're not going to get, you know, uh, impacted. But what we can be able to do is you'll be able to identify where the problem was very quickly and you'll be able to implement, you know, strategies to remedy that problem very quickly because that's really what we're trying to do is we're trying to get people to evaluate their entire operational process from A to Z. That way when something happens, because it's going to happen, something's going to happen, um, they can zero in on, okay, what went wrong? Uh, because if you're looking at and you're constantly evaluating, you're constantly kind of like self-testing yourself, uh, your operation. Then you'll be, you're putting your, your company in a position to succeed. Because if someone cuts a lock, if someone cuts the fence, if someone cuts the wires, you know, then you'll be able to go back to that and say, Hey, look, okay. So we had comms or we had, uh, uh, that container secured up until this point. 
And then we found at this point, so now we have an eight hour window where we, have, where we can zero down on. And those are the types of things we want to do. We want to give that company the ability not only to, to, to solidify the security of their operation, but also basically make them kind of audit proof in a way where if CT Pat or the local AEO officer comes and they want to take a look at everything, you can sit there and they open it up and say, you know, I'm not, I'm not, te- I'm not preparing for a test. This is how we run our operation. This is every day what we do here. And the Basque audit is very stringent in that if, if you get a CT Pat audit, it's usually once every five years. The Basque audit is once every year. And part of the requirements of a Basque audit is that you need to show during the year that you audited it yourself. And so we asked the companies to identify a couple of people on their staff to do an internal audit before we get there with our auditors. And so usually part of the audit process is, is evaluating their own audits that they did on themselves before we ever came in. And again, that's something that you have to renew that every single year. And that gives a lot of that, a lot of our companies that reassurance that, you know what, that they know that their operation is running tight and it's always going to run tight because it's something that they're constantly testing against themselves. Uh, a, a quick analogy that I'll give you is if you have an IT department, what do they do? They're constantly checking, they're testing and they're testing and they're testing and they're testing. They don't, they don't, they don't put in a security, uh, security software once and leave it alone. They're constantly letting it get tested and letting it get tested because they want to find those vulnerabilities and, 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 and close those vulnerabilities before something really bad happens. That's good that you're doing it annually because, um, for IT purposes, I know cybersecurity is a, is a big, uh, area in, um, the CT pad and, and AEO, uh, which I'm sure is also with Bass, but I mean, you can't, <laughs> it at least forces you, even if you don't have those IT companies that are, that are constantly, like you said, Eric, that are constantly, um, you know, updating and checking and testing against vulnerabilities. Um, at least it'll force you if you're in Bass, uh, it'll force you to do that annually and, and make sure that those, because I mean, technology changes day to day almost, you know, so, so you would need to, you would need to keep up with that. So, um, well, and, and to that point, what I was just going to say is that in, in looking at it, I mean, let's face it is that, you know, you don't want to get complacent and that's where things, you know, people have been out there, good corporate citizens for the longest time, they get complacent and guess what, <laughs> excuse me, guess what? There's a problem. Um, and, you know, uh, finding those vulnerabilities is uh, essential to so you can do something about it. Pivot or now shift into your conference. Uh, like I said, it, it is in Miami, September 25 and 26. I was looking at the agenda, a bunch of different uh, topics, everything from cyber, um, AI and all that blockchain to um, forced labor. So um, what else uh, do, do can we expect from there? Are, are there exhibitors? Are there vendors out there showing you how to protect yourself and all that kind of stuff? Uh, can you talk a little bit more about that? Yes, all, all of the above, Lalo, uh, and thanks for bringing it up. So every other year, the, the, the marquee event that Bass tries to coordinate is our global conference. And the last two that we've done uh, since the pandemic have been one, the, the one after the pandemic was in Cartagena, Colombia, and the one after that was in Lima, Peru. And so this year we're going to do it in Miami. And we're really excited about that because that gives us, you know, Miami's a gateway to Latin America. And I, I don't know how much time you spend traveling through Miami, but once you get to Miami, you can get almost anywhere else you need to get to in, uh, throughout the Western hemisphere on a direct flight. And the typically pretty affordable flights. And so that's become basically kind of like a very, very strategic location for the World Basketball Organization because we can connect to all of our offices very quickly through through Miami. A lot of our businesses, our Basque businesses, have satellite offices that are in Miami. So Miami is very important to us as, as a market. And, and, and also it's very close to Washington. And so we're able to, you know, there, it's a very quick flight to get down to Miami from Washington. And so what we've done is we put together a forum where we're inviting a lot of uh, senior executives from U.S. Customs Service, not only current, but also former, uh, to help us talk about challenges, trends, best practices, what they're seeing in, in the entire spectrum of su- supply chain security. And obviously, we want to make sure that that our companies can hear those um, hear hear those conversations, but also connect with each other. It's a forum for all of our members to be able to network with each other. In addition to inviting people that are not members, so that way they can meet us, they can get to know us. If they want to build their businesses into Latin America or vice versa, expand their business into U.S., 
you know, we want to create a forum for that. And so we've invited industry. We're going to have a lot of uh, folks presenting um, some of these technologies and some of this, uh, these, these, these emerging tools that are being used out there. You, you mentioned blockchain. Artificial intelligence is a big one now. Uh, so there's a lot of that kind of creeping into supply chain security. And so I, I know some of the conversations that we've had when I, when I run into you guys at different events, you know, a lot of those same companies are going to be presenting at, at our, at our conference. Uh, they're going to have booths there, uh, whether it's software to help you secure your supply chain, evaluate your supply chain, whether it's, uh, you know, physical security tools to secure track, uh, containers, uh, whether it's training to be able to, you know, educate the workforce or educate your partners on what supply chain security is, you know, all of that, we're trying to create a forum for that. Um, we're looking at anywhere between three to 500 people in attendance. Um, uh, we're, we're doing really well. Uh, we're capped at 500, but I get, I, I, at the, at the rate that we're filling the conference, I expect to get really close to that. Um, and again, those are going to be representatives of not only vast members, but basically anyone that's interested in supply chain security. Uh, we have a lot of folks that are, are going to be joining us. Uh, representing some of the academic side of supply chain security. And something that has been very interesting to, to me to see evolve now is that supply chain security now is a degree plan in many u universities. So we invited several universities to talk about that, to also kind of give them an avenue to, you know, recruit students into their programs or talk about some of the different uh, variations of the supply chain master of science degree that they're offering, which is a pretty fascinating thing. I wish I would have known about that 20 years ago. Um, but nonetheless, it's never too late, right? And so we're trying to basically just, just create, you know, just a, a welcoming forum for those that, that have a, uh, an interest in, in securing the supply chain, regardless of where you're operating from, whether you're operating from Latin America, from the Western Hemisphere, from the U.S., what have you. Uh, you'll find what you're looking for at the Bass Conference. As you mentioned, it's taking place in Miami, uh, September 25th and 26th. Uh, if you uh, uh, visit our website, you can see a link to that, get all the information you need. If you're interested in, in uh, attending and presenting and uh, uh, having an exhibit where you can demonstrate uh, some of your capabilities or some of your tools, uh, all that is available to, uh, to anyone that might be interested. Eric, the folks that should be attending, it sounds like I'm going to go through this and you tell me if uh, you need to add any more. Obviously, you know, uh, a company, especially even uh, freight forwarders and, and transportation companies and all that should be sending some of their security folks uh, in there and, and whatnot. But even companies, uh, you know, their security, you're probably your IT, somebody from your IT area, obviously your compliance uh, area uh, and all that. What uh, anybody else that should be involved in that? That's the key component, really, is, is the folks that are involved at the decision maker level, um, when it comes to securing, so security manager, operations manager, uh, anybody that's, that's usually now most companies are, are creating, if not a division, at least a, a small team that's dedicated to compliance. And so anybody that's in your compliance office, um, cause those folks typically are the ones that are looking at the CTPAT programs or the different AO programs. And so they're the ones that are kind of bringing it all together. And so really anybody that has anything to do with security or compliance, um, at the, at the upper levels, uh, that's usually going to be the target audience. I know I've run into you guys at the, uh, at the CT path, the trade summit now, uh, the last couple of years. And so really the same folks that you see at that, at the customs brokers conference, you're going to see a lot of the same people at the bass conference as well. Well, and the focus is a little bit different because, and, and so gaining that knowledge and expertise, <clears throat> the other would be, uh, folks that you just mentioned, if you are from a university or a college that has, uh, a degree in, you know, supply chain, uh, in logistics, obviously supply chain, uh, security or, or cargo uh, security type things and all that. They're, you know, obviously sending somebody from the university to look at that, review that, uh, the, the more of the current issues that you just mentioned in from the conference and take that back to see what, uh, updates they need to do for their, uh, uh, degrees to keep it uh, relevant and current uh, would be uh, paramount, I think. Definitely. And even promoting those degrees, because like I said, I've, I've learned a lot about those degrees and just in the recent years. And it's surprising to me how many universities have now are making that basically its own little department. It used to be just, you know, under buried under the business school. Uh, but now it's the school of supply chain security. And in a lot of these companies, uh, not companies, a lot of these universities are, are really branching out into that. And, and the fact, and again, if I were 
I, if I could go back in time and I could get my master's in supply chain security, I think it would have really opened up a lot of things for me that uh, it would have really kind of been very interesting. So now I'm, I'm big proponent of people looking at that because it is a growth industry. Um, and anyone that's gone to any of these conferences the last few years, you know, you've got thousands of people attending these, these supply chain security conferences, either representing a business or representing, you know, a vendor. Um, and so there's a lot, there's a lot out there. And that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to find a little bit uh, to offer to everybody that's in the, in the space. Eric, I want to thank you so much for uh, talking to me. Folks, <clears throat> this is a good conference to take a look at. <clears throat> I don't know. All of a sudden, I'm getting choked up about it. <laughs> <laughs> this is a good conference to attend. Uh, take a look at it. Miami uh, is a great place to uh, to uh, go down to for the conference and, and whatnot. The uh, we'll have contact information in our show notes and uh, and whatnot. But Eric, thank you so much for coming on to our show, and uh, this has been great. And uh, it's one of those that uh, I'm not going to be able to go down there this year, but hopefully the in future uh, conferences we'll get to attend. Well, thank you for inviting me, Lalo Andy. It's it's, it's a pleasure to, to join the podcast. I've been I've been following it for for quite some time now, so it's uh, it's a it's a it's a privilege to be with you guys, uh, and I look forward to seeing you guys soon. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Eric. Thank you very much for joining us. Simply Trade is brought to you by the generous contributions of Global Training Center. You can follow the show and GTC on LinkedIn or Twitter and other social networks. Make sure you check out the show notes in the description for a full rundown of today's show with all the important links. Also, make sure that you share this with a friend and subscribe on your favorite streaming platform. We really like hearing from you. If you enjoyed the show, make sure to rate and review wherever you listen to this podcast. If you or someone you know would like to be a guest on the show or would like to sponsor Simply Trade or suggest any topic you would like for us to discuss, please contact us via email at simplytrade at globaltrainingcenter.com or you can DM us on Twitter at simplytradepod. Thank you again for the privilege of your time. Happy trading. Simply Trade is not a law firm or an advisor. The topics and discussions conducted by Simply Trade hosts and guests should not be considered and is not intended to substitute legal advice. You should seek appropriate counsel for your own situation. These conversations and information are directed towards listeners in the United States for informational, educational, and entertainment purposes only and should not be substituted for legal advice. No listener or viewer of this podcast should act or refrain from acting on the basis of information on this podcast without first seeking legal advice from counsel. Information on this podcast may not be up to date depending on the time of publishing and the time of viewership. The content of this posting is provided as is. No representations are made that the content is error free. The views expressed in or through this podcast are those of the individual speakers, not those of their respective employers or Global Training Center as a whole. All liability with respect to actions taken or not taken based on the contents of this podcast are hereby expressly disclaimed.